Well, hello there, folks. Welcome back for module eight of the CompTIA A plus course. Chances are, if you're watching this module, you've most likely watched the other seven modules on my channel already. If you have not, I recommend you go and check those out first. So what is this module called? It is called Supporting Mobile Devices. So that alone should kind of give you an idea that this module is going to focus about or focus on mobile things, you know, for the most part. As for the sections within this module, the previous module only had two, but you guys saw that kept us busy for pretty much the whole module. This one has got four sections, so they're going to be a little bit shorter, but small sections. The first section we're going to be diving into is set up mobile devices and peripherals. Yep, sounds pretty cool. The second one will be configure mobile device apps. So it's going to be all about apps on your devices. The third one, which I feel doesn't really belong in this module, is install and configure laptop hardware. Now, I suppose if you look at a laptop as a device that you can carry around, and yeah, I suppose technically it's mobile, but normally when people say mobile these, these days, they mean a phone or a tablet, or at least a phone. Anywho, the fourth topic here, or fourth section, will be troubleshoot mobile device issues. So that's going to be more from a technical perspective. So the first, the second, and the fourth section feels like they belong in this module. It's just that third one that kind of, I don't know, it bugs me. It feels like it doesn't belong in this module, but that is what is in the module. So I'm going to cover it nonetheless. Anyway, homies, this is the point where you do me a favor and you boink that like button since I'm giving you guys this course for free. So the least you can do is give me a like for all of this. And um, for those of you that obviously want to know when module nine comes out, maybe consider subscribing. I've seen sometimes YouTube will tell you that it's out. Sometimes they won't unless you subscribe. So if you're afraid you might miss it, subscribe. If you don't care, well, then I don't care. Then it doesn't matter. So let's go to that first section, guys. Set up mobile devices and peripherals. Let's start with mobile display components. I've got a bit of a phone there on the right. So you wouldn't believe how hard it was to find that picture for this. Anyway, besides the point, so when it comes to display, that's got everything to do with your screen. The first subtopic here is digitizer functions. Now, a lot of you guys are probably wondering, what the heck is the digitizer? Guys, the digitizer is the front layer of your phone or your tablet. It's usually a phone or a tablet, but you do get some laptops that's got this as well. You do get some desktop screens that's got this as well. And why am I saying phones or tablets? Well, guys, a lot of you might not know this, but a phone or a tablet actually has multiple layers. And um, even other things like TVs, but that's besides the point here. If you were to go and take your phone apart, more specifically the screen for that matter, you would notice there's more than one layer. The very front layer, that, guys, is the digitizer. The digitizer layer is the one that actually senses your touch or the user's touch. So when you touch the screen and you scroll on the screen and you pinch or zoom in or zoom out on the screen, how do you think that is possible? That, guys, is the digitizer. Yep, well, I hope you guys just learned something. Now, the actual title here is Digitizer Functions. So I'm probably supposed to tell you guys, hey, it's not just touching. You can actually go and zoom in. You can go and zoom out. You can go and pinch. You can go and rotate the screen. You can do this and that. I kind of feel silly telling you guys that because I feel like even my child will know that these days. And I don't mean that as an insult to anyone. It's just that is how technology is these days. Uh, even a toddler, for crying out loud, has a smartphone. And even they can figure it out these days. So the chances of you not knowing that you can zoom in and out on a phone and scroll and all that stuff is very unlikely at this point in time. You know, unless you were staying under a rock, you'd probably know about that. Now, as for the glass layer and screen protectors, that is something we all have to do these days because even though these phones are getting smarter and cooler and they can do more and all that, they, I don't know, they feel very brittle to me. It's as if they break like crazy, really, really easy. So it's obviously very highly advisable that you go get yourself some sort of rubber cover for your phone so that if and when, I should probably say when, not if, because we know it's going to happen at some point, so that when you drop that phone, that it will not necessarily break on the first fall, but maybe only on the third or the fourth fall. <laughs> it sounds inevitable, doesn't it? 
Um, maybe also get yourself some sort of screen protector. You know, it protects us from scratches and stuff. And um, on that note, you'll find some of these covers you get for your phone it actually covers the screen as well. It actually folds closed. It doesn't look as as peeling, but it actually is a lot better at protecting the phone. So that if you drop it, and it was dropping screen first, and maybe let's say this is on a pebble or something, at least that wouldn't break the screen. So maybe something to go look at. At the end of the day, I'm going to leave that in your hands. It's your choice, but something to consider. Then we've got the rotating and removable screens. Now, the rotating factor, I think we all know that. I mean, tablets can do that, phones can do that, and sometimes it is listed as rotating or something close to that in your menus. You can go turn it on, you can go turn it off. Other times, especially in the beginning, it was listed as gyroscope. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I remember the very first time they added that in the A-plus exam, and I'm not talking about this, I'm talking like one of the way previous versions of, of A-plus. You guys are doing the 1000 and 100 series at the moment, which is currently the latest version. Before that, we had the 1000 series, before that we had the 900, and then the 800, and then the 700, and so on and so forth. So I'm talking about way back with the 800 series. So when that came out, I remember writing that exam, and very suddenly I saw questions about gyroscope, and I was like, what the heck is a gyroscope? I remember asking myself, what is that? I had an idea, but I wasn't 100% sure, doubting myself. Luckily, I passed the exam. And after the exam, and obviously out of curiosity, I'm going to go and check it out. And then I learned that what gyroscope is. It's obviously at that point in time, it was something relatively new because not everybody had a phone like we've got these days. You know, not smartphones weren't that popular back then. You know, they were still very, very, very new on the market. Nowadays, good luck finding a phone or a tablet that does not have some sort of gyroscope. It's able to basically, in a nutshell, detect which way is down, you know, with some form of gravity detection. And because of that, it can rotate the screen accordingly to you. Now, there are times when you don't want it to do that because maybe you're lying on your bed on your side and obviously the phone is now kind of on its side and the phone is going to think you're holding it the wrong way around and it's going to adjust the screen and sometimes you don't want to do that if you're lying on your side. Um, so you can actually go and turn off the gyroscope or screen rotating as they call it these days. Now as for the removable factor, it's not something I see a lot, at least not yet anyway, but there are phones out there guys and even tablets and laptops where you can in fact remove the screen from the phone. I saw it a while back, about 15 years ago, where I think it was Nokia. I stand to be corrected. You guys are welcome to correct me in the comment section down below. Uh, maybe just mention the comment section down below which make and model of phone you saw that has a removable screen. But there was a while back where I saw some phones, I think even Blackberry had that at some point, if I'm not mistaken, We you can go remove a screen from the actual phone. And then it just kind of disappeared off the market. And now it kind of feels like it's making a comeback. So yeah, feel free to let me know in the comment section down below. If you had or if you know of a phone, make and model where the screen is removable. That would be pretty cool. I would love to know so I can go and Google it afterwards. All right, so let's move on to the next topic, boys and girls. Mobile device accessories. Now, we all know what accessories is. That means we can go and add something to something. So if we're talking about accessories for ourselves, that will probably be something like a watch and some jewelry and maybe some sunglasses, you know, that kinds of stuff. So when it comes to mobile device accessories, that will basically be something that, well, you accessorize your phone with, I suppose. Probably things like headphones. I think the most common one will probably be some sort of headphones you plug into your phone. So what do they have in mind in this course? Well, guys, that is touch pads, track pads, and drawing pads. It's not the only things. They also have touch pens in mind. I think some of you guys would probably notice better as a stylus. Strangely enough, that's not what they call it in this version of the course. I know previously in the A-plus course they used to call it a stylus by its actual name. Now it's just called a touch pen. So I don't know why they changed that, but it's called a touch pen. So that's why I'm calling it a touch pen in this course. Um, I don't really see those with phones. I mean, you can get them for a phone. It's something I more often see with something like a note. You know, it's basically a combination between a phone and a tablet. So I'll see it on a note, I'll see it on some tablets, but I don't really see it on phones. I just don't. You get them, you can go buy them separately if you really want to, but yeah, I don't know. I just, I don't think it really caught on. Then you also, of course, get microphones, speakers, cameras, webcams, all of these kinds of things. So these devices we're talking about, they could be for your phone, they could be for a tablet, or they could be for a laptop. So remember, 
when they say mobile device in this module, they're not necessarily referring to a phone or a tablet. I mean, you guys saw earlier with section three, I mentioned the four sections we have in this in this module. And um, the third section was talking about laptops. We're going to be covering some aspect about laptops. And I suppose it's because, well, a mobile is a, a laptop is technically mobile. I mean, you are able to pick it up and you're able to walk around with it and be mobile with it, hence the name. So I suppose we could refer to a laptop as a mobile. And if we have that on our mind, this list actually makes more sense. I mean, if you look at a touchpad, that is something you normally see on a laptop. You don't see that on a tablet or a phone. Trackpads, drawing pads. Yeah, you're, that's more common on a laptop, isn't it? Touch pens, that's more on a tablet or a note. Microphone, I think all the devices have those. Speakers. Um, camera, that's more for a phone or a tablet. The webcam will probably be for the laptop or the notebook. You know, potato, potato. And if you guys look at that picture we've got there on the right, which I actually haven't been talking about. It's been there the whole time. It kind of sort of gives you an idea as to some of the available accessories. I mean, obviously, it's not limited to that. But if you look at the left-hand side of that picture, I mean, they've got printers and scanners, mouses, touchpads, and pens, and all kinds of things I see them mentioned there. I suppose some of those actually classify as accessories, if you think about it. Now, the next topic up here, guys, is Wi-Fi networking. I mean, look at the cool pictures I've added there for you guys. So first of all, let's talk about enabling and disabling. So I think by default, this is actually turned on um, on most devices, you know, tablets, phones, laptops. It's normally turned on by default, but it doesn't mean you will connect automatically by default. So the very first time you get to a new Wi-Fi spot slash hotspot, whatever you want to call it, you will need to choose it from a list, click on it, tap on it, select it, whatever. And it's 10 to 1 going to ask you for some form of password just to make sure you're actually allowed on that network and you're not some weenie that's up to no good. Once you do that, the device, phones, tablets, and laptops, all of them alike, would normally remember that network. So if you go out of range, it's going to disconnect. And eventually one day, whenever that might be, if you come back to that network and it's close enough, basically within range, your device would go and auto-connect back to that network assuming the password has not changed. If the password has changed, it ain't going to happen, guys. Now, you can, of course, go and force your device to forget a network. Yep, it's an actual option called forget. And if it forgets a network, the next time you come within range, it's definitely not going to even try to auto-connect to that net network, never mind remembering the password. You can go and turn off the Wi-Fi function on pretty much any device that's got a Wi-Fi availability. So that normally actually saves a bit of battery life, mind you. So if you do that on a phone or a tablet, it definitely saves its battery life. On a laptop, eh, doesn't make that big of a difference. But you can go and turn it off if you want to go and do that. Something else you folks can go and do, and I'm sure some of you have seen this. Heck, some of you guys might even have used this. It's airplane mode. So what that basically does, and this is mostly used on a phone or a tablet, like I said, it allows you to keep the device on, but it's not going to receive or, more importantly, broadcast any form of wireless communication. I mean, a phone does not just receive or make phone calls like in the old days. It's definitely not just that, guys. A phone, for example, has that NFC function. They've got Bluetooth. Some of them have got infrared. They've got, of course, the normal phone network. There's a lot of signals that they're broadcasting or receiving. And if you are on a plane, for example, that's bad. There's a myth going around that this can supposedly crash a plane. And um, I think someone confirmed once that that's not possible. I actually did a video on my channel where that was like a topic or a subtopic once. And I said in the video, if there's anyone that knows about this, uh, please let me know whether this myth is actually true or not. And then an actual pilot from an actual plane went and commented in the comment section. And they basically said, yay or nay on New York Day. I actually went and pinned that comment. And for the life of me, I cannot remember what video it was, I can't remember what course it was, but I know it's pinned on the channel. Good luck finding it, because there's a couple of hundred videos on my channel, so don't even bother, I don't even know where it is. It's just, it's somewhere deep, deep within the comment section, as I can tell you. But there's a myth going around that if a phone or a tablet or a laptop is on a plane, and they don't have their airplane mode on, those signals can interfere, basically, with the instruments of the plane. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the pilot said that it does not. 
But don't take my word for it because this is many moons ago. I really can't remember for sure. So that's the myth. So the idea is you're supposed to turn it off. And most of us would honestly just turn our phones off. It's a lot easier. Because if you're going to be turning all wireless communication off on your device, then it kind of renders it useless. The only thing you can do on it is maybe play offline games, watch some offline videos, watch some pictures, that kind of stuff. So there's not much you can do with that phone or a tablet, which is why most of us just kind of turn it off. But you can put it on airplane mode, which, well, basically renders the device useless for the most part. Let's talk about antenna placement. So when it comes to the antenna, this could be a phone, tablet, laptop, all that kinds of stuff. Um, you'll find there are going to be times where you've got no signal. Maybe you will have a signal and suddenly the signal goes away. This could be because you are moving around. So if it's a phone or a tablet, especially, chances are you might be walking around. So when your signal suddenly, you know, deteriorates, goes away, it could be that maybe you've moved without or, you know, out of range from where the signal is being broadcasted. So if you have some, some, some sort of Wi-Fi from someone or some sort of hotspot, maybe just maybe you've walked too far away and you need to walk back in the opposite direction so that you are within range again. It could just be a matter of maybe you are within range, but because of the unique placement of where this antenna is for this router or access point, maybe it's behind a wall or something that's interfering of the signal. So yeah, things to keep in mind, guys, when it comes to Wi-Fi networking. Make sure you're within range. Make sure there are not things in the way. Um, yeah, obvious things, right? All right, and then we've got mobile hotspots and tethering. So it's kind of the same thing, but at the same time, I want to tell you it's not. So we just talked about Wi-Fi networking, which is generally when we go and take our phones, tablets, laptops, those kinds of things, and we connect them to some sort of hotspot or wireless network, which is broadcasted usually by a router or an access point. Now, a mobile hotspot or tethering is still a hotspot or a Wi-Fi connection, but it's not broadcasted then by a router or an access point, guys. You can actually take your phone, your tablet, and even your laptops, yes, even your laptops, and if you have a connection on your phone, tablet, or laptop, you can, in fact, broadcast that wirelessly. And when you do that, other devices can connect to it just like they would connect to any other normal wireless communication. Yep, things you did not know. So first of all, hotspot is when you take your phone and you make a hotspot. Um, when you do that, you need to keep in mind, it's going to be using your data. So if you take your phone or your tablet and you make a hotspot, you can call it whatever you want. You can see there it's called CompTIA Mobile Hotspot in the picture. You can call it whatever you want. You can go put a posit on it, which is something we recommend. You can go put Mac filtering on it. Yep, even cell phones allow you to put in a Mac filter, for those of you who know what that is. You can do that. It's just added security so that not just any willy-nilly can connect to your your network, even if they've got the password, if their MAC address is not in your filter, ain't gonna happen. They're not gonna be able to connect to it. So when people connect to your hotspot, they will be using your phone's data or your tablet's data. Something you should definitely keep in mind because it can very quickly get very expensive or it can very quickly use all your data. Not something you obviously wanna go and do. I mean, that's just gonna suck, right? Um, tethering, pretty much the same deal, but you guys can see there in the picture. So you can either go and do USB tethering, you can go do mobile Wi-Fi hotspot, or you can go and do Bluetooth tethering. All the same thing at the end of the day. All right, let's move on to our next topic, mobile device wired connection methods. So these are obviously mobile devices, devices you can pick up and, well, go. It's not going to be a desktop PC. And um, you're probably wondering, okay, well, duh, why am I saying that? Because a laptop kind of technically classifies a mobile device too, if you think about it, because, well, you can pick it up and you can go. It is mobile. You can put it in a bag. You can carry it with you. Now, granted, it's a bit oversized if you go and compare it to a phone or a tablet, but it is still a mobile device, technically. On that note, since we're talking about wired connection methods, that would also mean laptop ports. So what can we plug into a laptop port, guys? Pretty much anything these days. If you go and check, the laptop has USB ports and USB, well, anything works on USB these days. Um, depending on your laptop, you might be able to plug in VGA, that's your screens, the old analog video signal. 
you might be able to plug in HDMI or display ports. That's the newer versions, the fancy technical ports. Uh, there's a lot of ports you can go and plug into a laptop, way more than a phone or a tablet. And as for smartphones and tablets, that would be for the most part USB-C for most modern devices these days. Now, yes, I know most devices um, use USB-C, but not necessarily all of them. But very soon it will be all of them. Um, in some countries, there's actually a law passing now where they're kind of forcing some manufacturers. I think iPhone is one of them where they're being forced to use USB-C now. And there's a very good reason behind that because we're wasting a lot, guys. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we can all just use the same freaking charger? You can go anywhere. You can borrow someone's charger. Boop, pop, there you go. Or if you had an old cell phone, which is now too old or no longer working, and you get a new cell phone or mobile device and the new one works in the old one's charger. Wouldn't that be nice? So now it's probably going to happen where you're going to be able to buy a phone in the future, a phone or a tablet. And when you buy that, it may or may not come with a charger. The charger might actually be sold separately because a lot of folks are buying mobile devices only to get a charger included when they actually have two or three spares lying around at home. So we're wasting a lot here. So if the charger is not included and you don't need it, this can actually very well bring the cost, bring down the cost of the devices. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? So we can bring down the cost of devices and this is going to be good for the environment. So yeah, USB-C, guys, is pretty much what we use for pretty much most cell phones and tablets these days, not to mention other devices. You also get micro USB or, well, mini USB for legacy devices. If you don't know what the word legacy means, remember that is for something old. Old hardware, old software, something that no longer has support, no longer has updates. This could be hardware or software. Uh, then you also have lightning for Apple devices. So if any of you folks are using some sort of Apple device, well, you can technically go and use a lightning cable. Yes, there's actually a cable called a lightning cable for those of you wondering. Let's talk about Bluetooth wireless connections. So obviously this is wireless. It's only one of many kinds of wireless signals. Now, in the beginning, you could probably only find this on things like your cell phone, maybe a tablet if you were rich enough back in the day to afford a tablet. Nowadays, any weasel and his uncle has a phone and a tablet and a laptop and a desktop and, and, and. So all of these devices has Bluetooth capability these days. You can turn it off, you can turn it on, and it's very rare you will find someone connecting one mobile phone to another mobile phone. About 5, 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, that's pretty much all we did. If someone had a cool song on their phone um, and you wanted it, you'd probably go and get it from them via Bluetooth. Nowadays, that's probably the last thing someone would go and use Bluetooth for. It's a heck of a lot quicker just to send someone a music song, an MP3, over WhatsApp or something close to that. So what do we use Bluetooth for then, if we don't use it to connect two phones to one another? We use it to connect our phones to all kinds of other goodies. This could be a wireless headphones, headsets, you can go and connect it to a car, you get these cool boom boxes. Heck guys, the list is very long as to what you go and connect your phone or whatever to these days. Um, so normally if you want to go and connect, you can have to go and do something called pairing. So you can have to go and enable pairing. It can sometimes be a bit tricky if you're going to try and connect to something that's not a phone or a tablet. So if you're going to try and connect to something like, uh, let's say, a car, the car may or may not present you with a code. The phone may or may not present you with a code. And you're going to have to verify if the code is correct. Or you might have to possibly go and type in a code somewhere. Just mentioning it to you guys. And you can see here they mentioned the PIN code. So if you're going to be trying to pair with something, especially if it's not another phone or a tablet, it's probably going to ask you for a code on the one device, which is going to be visible on the other device. And this is just to make extra sure that you really are trying to connect via Bluetooth and that you're not being hacked or something in that regard. I mean, nobody wants that, of course. Moving on to near field communication wireless connections, better known as NFC for short. So these days, guys, you get this on pretty much anything and it's becoming the next thing these days. So this is commonly known as tap and go as well. So you probably see most people paying over their bank cards these days by just tapping it on some sort of speed point or pay point. It's not like in the old days, we'll have to go and physically put the card into a slot, wait a bit, and then you insert your pin. No, not necessarily. Most of the time, folks these days, just bring the card near a speed point, tap it on a screen or the above of the speed point, and the payment will go through. 
In some cases it might ask for a pin, sometimes it won't. It depends on whether you enable the pin or not, and it depends on the value of the transaction. Now what you guys will also see happening a lot these days is a lot of people are using their mobile device as a payment card. This is most commonly going to be the people's cell phone. So how this works is you go into your phone, you open your banking app, because pretty much all banks have a banking app these days, and they love forcing you to use that. Once you've opened your banking app, you're going to have to go and choose your digital card. Once you've chosen your digital card, you bring the phone near the speed point, and it's pretty much exactly the same as bringing your car near the speed point. Some things worth mentioning here, guys, is this does not work on all phones. So even if you've got a smartphone and even though you've got the banking app and a virtual card, it does not mean this will work on your phone. Now, way in the beginning, this only worked on Samsung cell phones. And it was only on certain models, some of the latest models. And it's, I mean, like with most things in life, the, the competition is normally not far behind. So it's safe to assume other brands or phones can also do it now and other models in those brands can also do it now. Which ones exactly? I don't know. You're going to have to go and check that. So if you're going to like, if you would like to use this function, I encourage you guys to double check if that phone has the function first before you purchase it. Unless you already have a phone, you just want to go and check if it can do it. In my honest opinion, it's actually a lot more secure to use it on your phone, the bank card, because if someone has your bank card, they can just go and tap on a speed point and boop, bop, there they go. They've stolen your money. As compared to a phone, the phone is locked. And if they do manage to get the phone open, your banking app is locked. So they need to get into your banking app as well. So it's kind of like multi-factor, triple multi-factor of indication. So it's a heck of a lot more secure to have a digital card. Um, what I've also seen a lot of people do these days is they'll have their card loaded on some other cool fancy device, like a watch. Now those are really cool. So if you're a person who would like to show off, get yourself one of those fancy, fancy watches where you can go and load your banking card on your watch. Imagine that. Coming to a pay point and just hovering your watch near the pay point and boop, bop, there you go. Payment goes through. I can only imagine how cool that must be. All right, moving on to port replicators and docking stations. So port replicator, let's talk about that first. That is if you have a port on your laptop, desktop or something. Let's face it, it's probably going to be your laptop or your desktop. And you would like more ports like that one. Let's use the example of a USB port. So your laptop only has one or two USB ports and you are in dire need of more USB ports because you need to plug in more devices. What can you do? Well, you can go and get yourself a little hub of sorts. You get lots of thingies like that. One would be a hub. So essentially what's going to happen is you're going to plug a USB wire into one of your existing USB ports. Heck, for all I know, it might be your only USB port. And it's going to expand that USB port into three, four, or more USB ports. It's basically going to give you more, more commonly known as a hub. So here's a bit of a picture for you guys so you can see what that looks like. The next thing I want to mention to you guys is docking station, like the topic title says. So docking station is not really something we use anymore. Honestly, I haven't seen these in the last 15 or 20 years. Um, I've been told they still exist. They are still out there, but yeah, good luck finding one, guys. You're probably not going to find one. So in the old days, what happened was people would have these fancy big laptops. It was as heavy as a brick, probably two or three bricks. And um, you would bring this laptop to a desk. There would be a docking station on the desk. And you slide your laptop into or onto this docking station. Your laptop would have special ports at the back or the bottom of it. And the docking station also have special, special slots that will basically slide into those special ports on your laptop. And this would give your laptop... A nice keyboard, a desktop keyboard you could possibly use, a desktop mouse, a desktop screen, a printer. That's basically what it was all about. Nowadays, we don't do a docking station. Why? Because these days, laptops have a lot of ports in them, and you can just plug an external screen in, HDMI, DisplayPort, VGA. I mean, there's so many ports that you can choose from from the average laptop or notebook. And you've obviously got USB ports as well. So if you need a desktop mouse, just plug one in. You need a desktop keyboard? Well, just plug one in. Easy as like that. So here's a bit of a picture for you guys. You can see what the cheese I'm talking about. So that is what a docking station looks like. And um, here is more or less a picture of what it would look like once the laptop is actually connected to that doohickey. At least now you're not going to be completely confused as to what the heck I was talking about. 
So if you look at the bottom right picture there, you can see the laptop has been slid into that. Most laptops these days, if not all, have no ports like that at the back. If you go and check at the back of most laptops now or the bottom, there is no ports there, guys. It's just blank. There's nothing there to be found. All right, so that brings us to the end of that main section. Let's move on to the next main section of this module, which is mobile device apps. It should come as no surprise what the first topic in this section is. Yep, mobile apps. No surprise at all. So I think we can all relate to what a mobile app is. I mean, you can go and ask a three-year-old these days and they'll be able to tell you what a mobile app is because most three-year-olds even have a mobile phone these days. So the question here comes down to what kind of device do you have? Is it a tablet? Is it a mobile phone? Is it a phablet? Yes, you get something called a phablet. And on these devices, what brand is it? Is this, for example, a Huawei? Is it, for example, a Samsung? What kind of brand are we dealing with? Because that is going to have an influence on the operating system running on that device. Some of these devices are running Android. Some of these devices are running iOS, which is Apple. Some of them are running something else. It depends on how well known your phone is. So iOS and Android is probably the two biggest operating systems, the well known ones, at least at the time of when I made this this video for you guys, but there's probably going to be other ones coming to the party very soon. So iOS, what do we use on that operating system to get our apps? Most commonly, the average Joe would go to, into the App Store. So this is going to be probably for iPhones. So you're going to go into the App Store. And if we're talking about Android, or Android apps, Android phones, what do we use on those devices to get apps? You're going to go into the Google Play Store. If you look at other phones of other operating systems like Huawei, because Huawei has their own operating system, now it used to be Android, there you're going to go into the app Gallery, or there you might go into an app called Fendora. Now on all of the devices we've mentioned so far, and other ones, if you don't find the app you're looking for, you can actually go into a good old-fashioned web browser of your choice, and just run a search for the APK file, and that's going to allow you to go and install it. Not something you recommend, that should normally be your last resort because that's a very good chance of you getting a virus of some kind if you're going to go and try that. All right, so if you are going to go to one of these stores, let's say you decide to go to the Play Store because you're using Android. Uh, you guys need to, in general, be careful on those stores as well. It's probably less likely to have some form of malware compared to going to a browser and downloading some sort of app for your phone. But it doesn't mean there are no malwares on those stores. Now, if you're going to go and download something well-known, like WhatsApp, you should be okay. Because it's very well-known. If there was something wrong of it, you would have known about it. It would have been on the news. People would have complained. People love complaining if something doesn't work. So you would know about it. The ones you need to be careful for is the ones that you never hear about. If there's some game or some application on the Play Store or the App Store, you've never heard of it before. You don't know anyone that uses it, but you want it those are the ones you need to be very careful for. So if you don't know anyone that uses that game or that, that application, you're taking a huge leap of faith. Now some folks will say, I go look at the reviews, especially if you look at the Play Store. They'll tell you, I look at how many stars it's got, I look at the comments. Did you know you can actually go and rate your own app or game on the Play Store? Did you know you can actually go and comment on your app or your game on the Play Store? Now, on that note, that means people can go and give you fake ratings. Now, you're going to go look at the ratings. It looks like it's almost five stars. You can go look at the comments. People say, this is a great app. This is a great game. It's the best I've ever seen. Meanwhile, it's all fake. And as soon as you go and download that, boom, you've got malware. So be very, very careful when downloading things you've never heard of before, guys. Now, in this section, let's talk about types of data to synchronize. Now when we say this, we're for the most part talking about phones and tablets. I know a laptop also counts as a mobile device, but we're talking more about phones and tablets when we talk about this topic. So the types of data you can go and synchronize, at least according to CompTIA, is contacts, your calendar, your mail, your pictures, music, video and documents, and then of course your applications. Nobody really synchronizes these things anymore these days, at least not via a wire. This all happens automatically. So the only time I've seen people synchronize their contacts is if their phone has gotten lost or stolen. They've acquired themselves a new SIM card and they would like to go and synchronize their contacts from their cell phone provider because sometimes they saved their contacts to the SIM card. And if you lose your phone and you get a new SIM card, we basically just do a SIM swap 
you have the same old phone number and all that I mean, you can actually go and ask your cell phone provider and contact them and you can go and have them synchronize your contacts back to your phone your new phone of course it's the only time i've seen people synchronize contacts other than that i don't see it calendar is not something we go and synchronize manually but it is something that's pretty useful i've seen a lot of people do that and this happens automatically on most phones these days so as soon as you go onto the average phone and you open the default email clients heck i've seen most phones these days have multiple email clients but as soon as you open one of those default email clients and you go hook up your gmail your work email which is probably going to be office 365 as soon as you do that your calendar will automatically synchronize to your phone which is really cool your email will automatically synchronize to your phone when it comes to pictures music video and documents that's stuff we normally don't synchronize you're actually supposed to i wouldn't say that's a rule but at some point in time you are going to lose your phone you're going to break your phone it might get lost stolen and not if but when that happens you're going to be very angry with yourself for not backing all this stuff up so you should go and synchronize that stuff to a laptop or desktop or some sort of external device or better yet synchronize it to the cloud to OneDrive, to your dropbox to your google drive go and synchronize to the cloud so that if you lose your device for whatever reason and you get yourself a new device you can just go and synchronize it back down to your device now we all know we should do this and yet none of us do some of the excuses we use is data is expensive so you're going to wait until you get to a wi-fi or a hotspot and then when you eventually get to a wi-fi or hotspot we still don't do it and we're like no i'm busy now or i'm not in the mood we basically kick the can down the road and i'm telling you guys to go and synchronize your stuff and the fact of the matter is even i'm guilty even i don't do it there's so many times i've stolen my phone and then i'm mad at myself because i had pictures and videos on there which was irreplaceable and then when I get the next phone, I tell myself, I'm definitely going to back up this time. And guess what? I still don't do it because it's too much work and I'm lazy like that. As to the applications, I haven't seen people synchronize that. So it's unlikely you're going to be doing that with your normal average day phone. So since we were talking about email, just a couple of bullet points ago, let's mention email configuration options. Now, let me tell you guys, configuring email on a phone or a tablet is very, very easy these days. But that was not always the case. As recently as up to 2016, 2017, it was a painstaking process, especially if you had to go and do this for a client or a user. Even more so if that client or that user was nowhere near you. So for many, many of my clients, I could go on a system of their email remotely over the internet with my laptop. So I would ask them, you know, to go and install TeamViewer or VLC or VNC or any desk, you know, one of those tools that you basically use to go and remote connect to someone's machine. I would ask them to install that. I would do the same. I would remote connect to that person's machine. And once I've done that, I would just go and set up their email accordingly. Very quickly, very easily, no problems. I would just need to get the incoming and outgoing mail service and all that kind of stuff. Now, when it comes to cell phones, mobile phones, tablets, that kind of stuff, that was a whole new ball game. Because now I can't just go and remote connect to the person's device. Some of these folks were very, very far away. And they absolutely insisted on me putting their work email on their mobile device. So there was times I had to drive out for hours to get to some of these clients only to go and put email on the person's work phone. Can you imagine that? driving hours and hours to get to a client only to go and put his work email or her work email on their mobile device. Can you imagine how annoying that must be? And that's what I had to go and live with. So Gmail was like that. Office 365 was like that. And those are the two main ones my clients used to go and use. Fortunately for you guys, you don't have to struggle with that stuff like I used to have to struggle with. So if you go to the average person's phone now, you just type in their email. This can be their Gmail or Office 365 email address. You type in their password. And it's going to automatically detect the settings that is needed. It's going to do auto discover, something called auto discover. So you don't need to worry about it. So when it comes to commercial provider email configuration, um, what are we going to use? Auto discover settings. Your Gmail, your Office 365 file will automatically discover all the settings. It's incoming and outgoing, you know, mail service, its port numbers. Everything will be discovered by something called auto discover. You don't need to worry about it. So it's gotten to a point where even a child can go and configure email address on a phone or a tablet. Now when it comes to corporate or ISP email configuration, these are firstly very, very rare. But sometimes you will have some sort of corporate email address or one that's provided by your internet service provider. 
Now, when you have those, they could go either way. Sometimes they work with auto discover, and then you're very lucky. Other times they're very old school, and you might need to still go and configure them manually. So it's not rocket science to go and do that for us, I think, guys. But at the end of the day, I would say the hardest part here is obtaining those details because sometimes nobody knows what they are. So now you need to try and figure out what is the incoming mail server, what is the outgoing mail server, are there port numbers you need to go and configure for incoming and outgoing, and do you need to go and configure encryption? That is stuff we don't always know, and sometimes the people you ask, they also don't know, which makes this a bit of a, a train smash in some cases. All right, so we've been talking a lot about synchronization. Let's talk about synchronization methods. How can we go about synchronizing our stuffs? And I've accidentally given you guys the answer to this one earlier when we talked about synchronizing our pictures, videos, music, that kind of stuff. I accidentally gave you guys the answer to this one. So the first one is synchronization via cloud accounts, which is the one I actually recommended to you guys. One of the problems of that, and I'm not talking about me being lazy, is data limits, better known as data caps. There's a cap. So you have some sort of phone or tablet it's got some sort of plan on it, some phone plan or mobile plan or data plan. It's got a data limit for the month or the week or whatever. And if you're going to be uploading or synchronizing all your stuff or backupping all your stuff into the cloud, it's going to probably end up using all your data and then kaput. Then you have no data. That is a limit. That is a problem in a lot of countries. Other issues here is storage limits for accounts. So when you decide to go and upload all this nonsense to your Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive, whatever you decide to go and use, some of these platforms have a storage limit. If you go look at something like OneDrive, for example, it's got a five gig limit if you've got a free account on OneDrive. Yes, you get a free account on OneDrive. And if you get yourself a paid version, by default, it'll give you one terabyte's worth of space. I mean, that's a lot. So if you're assuming you're using one of the free versions, which let's face it, most of us do in our personal capacity, it's gonna be a bit of a problem if you wanna go and synchronize your photos, videos, and that kinds of stuff to the cloud because you're very quickly gonna run out probably within a matter of days are you going to run out. Another method you can go and synchronize, or should I say another place you can synchronize to, besides the cloud, is of course your laptop or desktop, your PCs. How you do that is up to you. This can be done via Bluetooth. I don't recommend Bluetooth because it's very slow. You're going to be copying a lot of stuff. You can do it via Wi-Fi, wireless in other words. That's a heck of a lot quicker. Or you can go and use good old-fashioned USB file transfer. So you're just going to go and take the USB cable that comes with your phone, plug it out of the charger, plug it into your laptop, plug that end into your phone, and voila! You don't need to install any software, you don't need to run any software, you just open Explorer on your computer, go to your phone, and there you go. I have noticed that when you connect to a phone via PC, it will not by default allow you to explore the phone unless you've unlocked the phone. So if there's a pattern on the phone, you need to draw the pattern first. There's a pin on the phone, you need to go and type in the pin first. Otherwise, it's not going to give you access because for all we know, this could be a stolen phone that you're trying to break into. So just to make sure, extra tippy toe sure that the phone indeed does belong to you and that you do indeed have permission to remote connect to it in some sort of manner, you need to go and provide some sort of authentication first that you are the owner to that device. Now, speaking of devices, moving on to the topic of enterprise mobility management. This is better known as MDMs for short. So everybody in IT just normally calls this an MDM because enterprise mobility management is a heck of a big word. The actual word is mobile device management, by the way. We don't say that, it's just too big. So instead of saying mobile device management, we just say MDM. What is an MDM? Guys, you don't just get one, you actually get many. One of the main ones, most commonly known ones, most well-known ones, is something called Microsoft Intune. It's a very cool tool, and I believe the name has now changed. The name is no longer called Microsoft Intune. It's now called Endpoint Configuration Manager because it allows you to manage your endpoints. These endpoints they speak of is things like phones, tablets, laptops, and desktops. Now, what do you call this Intune? What do you call this Endpoint Configuration Manager? Potato, potato, it still does the same thing at the end of the day. You will need to go to the Microsoft Azure Cloud Platform. You need a subscription for that. And once you've gotten there, you need to go to Intune or Endpoint Configuration Manager, whatever you want to go and call it. You need a subscription for that too. I mean, that's typical Microsoft for you. You need a license, we need a license, we need a license. So this Intune thing they speak of, it was originally designed to allow you as the administrator to manage and control mobile phones and tablets. Yep. 
but that's not the only thing we use it for. We also use this to go and manage laptops and desktops. It's definitely not just used for phones and tablets. So when we say managing phones and tablets, what exactly can you do? Well, guys, these users of yours don't need to be in your office. And let's face it, a lot of these users probably will not be in your office because that's the new trend these days. People working from home, of course, that's the future. Everybody has the ability to work remotely and they normally do because it saves them time, it saves them fuel, it saves them a lot of things. And you know, and then you can sit in the comfort of your own home, of course. Plus the office is saving money now because of toilet paper. You wouldn't believe how much that costs when you've got employees. They're saving money on coffee, they're saving money on tea and milk and sugar and all that kinds of stuff. It's amazing how much money companies can save on just those small things. So when it comes to managing these devices, I can see what device you've got as a user. So I can see, okay, this user has a phone or a tablet or a laptop or a desktop. I can see what your hardware specs is of that device, what processing power it has, how much system memory it has, you know, RAM in other words, how much storage it's got, hard drive in other words. I can see what operating system it's got installed, whether it is Android, iOS, Windows, whether it's Linux, Unix, Red Hat, I can see it all, guys. I can see what build it has installed, what edition it's got installed, what version it's got installed. I can see what updates your device has got installed, what drivers it's got installed, what applications it's got installed. Never mind seeing I can do. I can install updates, drivers, or programs. I can uninstall updates, drivers, and programs. I can go and run compliance scans to check if you are doing what you're supposed to do. So if you try and install something you're not supposed to, it's going to get uninstalled automatically. If you uninstall something you're not supposed to, it's going to get reinstalled automatically. The list of things you can see and do, guys, is mind-boggling. And there's a whole course for just that. You know, there's actually multiple courses for just that. But unfortunately, we can't just talk about that all day because that's not what this course is about. So in short here, MDM gives you authentication policies. It gives you compliance policies, which I accidentally just mentioned. It gives you control device features, and it gives you remote device reset or remote device wipe. So you actually have the ability to go and remote wipe these devices. Microsoft says, because it's actually a Microsoft concept, they say it is in case a user misplaces their device or in case the device gets stolen. Now, if it's lost or misplaced, sure, you can go and remote wipe it because it's probably still going to be on. But think about it. If someone steals your device, what is the first thing they normally do? They turn it off. If it's got a SIM card, they also take that out. So if it's not on some sort of mobile network or Wi-Fi network, it's going to be unable to receive that instruction, which is to go and wipe itself. So technically, they can still have access to the device. So if you're concerned about data, you should probably go and use encryption, like BitLocker encryption. So if this is like a laptop, for heaven's sake, guys, use encryption, use something like BitLocker encryption, so that if you cannot wipe the device, at least the data cannot get into the wrong hands because, well, the device is encrypted. So yeah, remote wipe is a pretty cool function to go and use if it is just misplaced. Where it actually works better is if your company has an employee which has now left the company and they have a device that has company information on it, which you or the company might feel is too sensitive. This device is normally something that belongs to the user. So it's a BYOD scenario. In other words, bring your own device. They probably were using their own phone or their own tablet or own laptop for the purposes of work. And when they leave the company for whatever reason, they sometimes still have some of the company's information on their own personal device. And if the company feels uncomfortable of that, they can go and wipe your device completely if need be. Yep. Now you might probably go and argue and say, no, I'm going to sue them if they do that. And no, you're not. You normally agree to it. And it's not only a piece of paper you sign, it's a digital agreement. So there's a lot of stuff that's running on your phone, like when you put your company's Teams environment on your phone, you put your company's work email on your phone, you'll find it's quite often things you've got to agree to. Those terms and conditions and rules and stuff we never read through. Yeah, next time go and read for that. You'll see you actually gave them permission, written permission to go and wipe your device if they deem it necessary. So think again next time they want to go and complain, you want to go and complain about them wiping your device. All right, so talking about security, next up we've got two-factor authentication. So that means you need to provide two forms of authentication. So you guys will find if you go look at something like a phone or a tablet, those are very good examples. A lot of them have more than one way for you to go and unlock these devices these days. 
So besides typing your old pin like we did many moons ago, you can go draw a pattern on a screen. You can go provide a fingerprint. Most devices these days accept a fingerprint. It's either going to be on the side of the phone, the back of the phone, or you can even hold it on the screen in some cases. Or, which is really cool, facial recognition. That is really dope in my opinion. These are all forms or ways for you to go and unlock phones these days. You get secondary authentication to corporate workspace. So this could be two-factor authentication and verification. Report and verify sign-in via second device or account. So as soon as someone or something tries to sign into something of yours, normally a work account or a normal work platform, you are going to receive some sort of notification. So if you try to sign into my work email, it's going to send me an email or an SMS or something in that regard, informing me that, hey, you have just signed in from somewhere else. I've actually seen Gmail does that too now. So if you try and sign into your Gmail or your YouTube or whatever from someplace new or a new device, you're going to find you're going to get a notification in your email that says, hey, listen, my bra, you have just signed in from a new browser or a new device or a new location. Is this indeed you? Because for all we know, this could really be a perpetrator. It's probably going to be you, but you never know. One day is one day and it might not be you. All right, folks, that finally brings us to the end of that section. And we can now move on to the next main section of this course, which is install and configure laptop hardware. Now, obviously, in this section, we're going to be talking mostly just about, well, laptops. The first thing we're going to be talking about in laptops is the laptop disassembly process, taking it apart. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, taking a laptop apart is actually not that difficult. You can figure it out on your own, probably without any instructions, without any video. It is putting the freaking thing back together and getting it to actually work afterwards. Now, that is a skill. Taking it apart, yeah, you know what, my son can do that. And my son is six years old. But putting it back together, that's uh, a different kind of worms. So you're going to have to go look at your hand tools and parts. Do you have the right tools? Do you have the right parts? I wouldn't recommend starting this process unless you've got the right tools and parts. You need to go look at the screw types on that laptop and the locations. It's not the same for all laptops, guys. If you go look at something like a desktop PC, they normally work of two main kinds of screws. If you've seen one desktop, you've seen another. If you've got a star screwdriver and a flat screwdriver, your, your standard star and flat screwdrivers, that's good enough. You can go and strip a whole desktop piece and you can put it back together. Now, as for a laptop, one laptop will differ day and night from the next laptop. And you'll find these can even be from the same manufacturer. They can be from the same manufacturer, same vendor, just different models, and they will differ day and night from one another, guys. So I would advise you to go and check where are these screws. Some of them are sometimes hidden. And I want you to go and check what kind of screws they are, you know, because the groovings on them are not always the same. So you need to, you might need to use different size screwdrivers, different size stars, different size flats. And you, in some cases, you'll even use other weird screwdrivers, which you can only find on hardware stores. When you start taking this laptop apart, it's going to be a unique process for each and every one of these laptops, guys. So as you start taking the laptop apart, it's probably going to be the back panel, most likely. I want you to take a piece of paper, a white piece of paper or something close to that. And when you take the screws out, put them in a pile, a nice neat little pile on that piece of paper, draw a circle around those screws and write next to that screws what it is or where those screws came out of. Because I can tell you now, when you need to put that laptop together, you're going to find there's going to be so many freaking screws, different sizes, different groovings, different lengths, and you're not going to remember where all of them need to go. If you put a screw in that's too long in the wrong place, it can end up damaging something. If you put a screw in that's too short in the wrong place, something could end up falling apart and then it's going also probably end up damaging something. It's very, very important you put the right screws back into the right locations. Otherwise, it's not going to end well, guys. So every time you start off a new panel or a new component, you draw a new circle on that piece of paper, you put those screws in that circle and you give it a nice little label, slap a nice little label next to it where you can go and see what it was. And eventually one day when you start putting this laptop back together, you just go and check the circles and you just put the right screws in the right location, of course. Should you want to go and take a part out of the laptop or if you want to go put a new part into the laptop, you will find these brand spanking new parts normally come in a special baggie, sometimes transparent, sometimes silver in color. And this is because these bags are anti-static. You remember in the previous modules, we spoke about ESD, electrostatic discharge. The human body has enough static electricity to blow circuitry like a motherboard, a RAM module, things like that. 
So to prevent this from accidentally happening, these components come in anti-static bags, anti-static protection. It's pretty cool, right? So make sure you put your components in anti-static bags. If you remove something from the laptop, it's still working. Make sure that's also in an anti-static bag. And when you work on the laptop, it's also recommended you put this laptop on a rubber mat. It's recommended you go and use an anti-static wrist strap. At least that's what the course tells you to go and do. We know in real life, none of you guys are really going to go and do that. But that's what's recommended. Lastly, guys, form factors. Laptops come forth in quite a few form factors. That's the actual shape and dimensions. So many, many moons ago, the thickness of these things was insane. It was probably thicker than your arm. Nowadays, even the biggest laptops are quite slim. It's amazing what they're able to do and how much they're able to shove in in such a small amount of space. It's just amazing in my opinion. So the form factors is you get these small little ones. They call them notes. I don't know why they call them notes. It's still a laptop in my opinion. The screen is smaller. The laptop itself is smaller. You can literally fit it into a small little backpack. When you get the full-size laptops with the 19-inch screens, those they still call laptops. But the small ones, those they call notes. All right, folks. And then we have battery replacement. And let me tell you, you are going to be replacing a lot of these, especially those little adapters that you get that actually charges your laptop. So when it comes to battery replacement, let's first talk about the AC adapters. If you don't know what the heck that is, there's a picture for you guys of what it would more or less look like. So that charger of yours that you plug into the average laptop normally has a little boxy on it. That little boxy, guys, is your adapter. Also a transformer. So it's the same thing. Potato, potato. It's an adapter. It's a little boxy. It's a transformer. So of that thing, you wouldn't believe how often they fail. I can't tell you how many times I've had users come to me and complain, my laptop does not want to start, it does not want to turn on, or it does not want to charge. And after troubleshooting, it always turns out to be the adapter. So if someone complains the laptop does not want to turn on, the very first thing I want you guys to go and do is check the charger. Plug the charger out, get another charger that fits on that laptop, one that you know for a fact is working, make sure it's a working one, Plug it in. If the laptop starts, well, here you know, it's the adapter. And it's probably going to start. There's a 90% chance it's going to start. If it does not start, then you know, okay, it's something else. It might be the battery. It might be the laptop itself. But there's a 90% chance it's actually going to start if you change the adapter. Now, I don't want you guys just buying an adapter before you actually go and test if it's the adapter because these things are insanely expensive for some reason. Unless you go and buy some pirate one, which I don't recommend you do, they're bound to fail very quickly. Now, as for battery life on a laptop, that depends on how much you use and abuse it in most cases. You'll find a lot of laptops these days are kind of sealed. They don't actually allow you to change the batteries as much as they used to. So maybe about 5 or 10 years ago, I would say 10 years ago, almost all laptops had removable batteries. And eventually one day when that battery fails, because no battery lasts forever, you can just go get yourself a new battery. They are quite expensive, obviously. You slide that sucker in there and here you go. You're all set. Nowadays, laptops are sealed. And if you go and buy yourself a laptop, guess what? That laptop, that battery it comes out with, you're stuck with it. So if that battery fails one day, you might have to go and buy yourself a new battery. It is a very unfortunate kind of thing. I'm not exactly sure why they do that. I suspect it's because they want us to buy a new laptops because at the end of the day, it always comes back down to money. So yeah, it's, it's unfortunate is all I can say. Now, since we're talking about replacing things still, let's talk about RAM and adapter replacements. We're still on the topic of laptops, just in case you guys are wondering. So when it comes to upgrading RAM modules or chips or whatever you want to go and call it, it's got so many names when it comes to laptops. What do we call it in a laptop? Laptop RAM, guys, is called SODIMS. So you're going to be sliding those SODIMS into SODIM memory slots. There's a picture for you guys. So if you look at that picture, in height, the RAM module or chip is the same height as a desktop or server RAM module or chip, but the width of it is much different. It's only about two-thirds of the width of a normal RAM chip. That's how you identify them. So visually, you can immediately identify them because of the width of these chips. A laptop RAM chip is not nearly as wide as a desktop or a server RAM chip. So immediately, you can see it's a sodium RAM chip. And you'll find the average laptop has a maximum of two slots. So if it has two RAM modules in there, the chances are you're probably not going to be able to upgrade it. Yes, you can take those RAM modules out and replace them with bigger ones. But the question here is not whether you can 
just go and put in bigger ones. It's probably going to fit in there physically. It's whether the motherboard actually supports bigger RAM modules. Because normally if it has two RAM modules in there, you can go and check that laptop is 10 to 1 already maxed out. So you're going to have to go and check in the specs of that motherboard of that laptop. Go check the make and the model. You can go and Google it if you need to. And on Google, you can normally see what the maximum supported memory for that laptop or that motherboard is. If the maximum supported memory is, for example, 8 gigs, and you go and check and you see this laptop already has 8 gigs installed, don't even bother because if you're going to replace those RAMs with the bigger ones, the laptop is probably 10 to 1, not even going to start. So if it does support more RAM, well, then you can go and try it. Then you might get lucky, but normally that's not going to happen, guys. And then we've got upgrading adapter cards. This can be a lot of things, guys, but 10 to 1, in most cases, this is going to be something like your Wi-Fi card. Yes, there's an actual card, like a Wi-Fi card. There's a picture for you guys of what it would more or less look like. I'm saying more or less because it does not look the same for all laptops. The place you locate this will vary. Um, the, what it, the what it looks like will vary. But generally, that is give or take what it would look like. You can actually go and screw it out, plug it out, and you can plug a new one in there. Just make sure it's actually compatible with your laptop. And that brings us to the end of another section, guys. Whoa, there's a lot of sections in this module. Uh, we're probably over an hour by now in this video. So if you guys are still watching at this point, do me a favor, drop a comment down below and you can go and type something crazy like, I saw a sea monster. Now that's really going to confuse the heck out of people if you go and type that there. Only people that's watched the video up until this point would know what the heck you're talking about. So if you want to have some fun with the guys that don't actually watch the full video, go and type in the comment section, I saw the sea monster. And they're going to wonder what sea monster you're talking about. And of course, if you've got any questions about what, what we've discussed so far or what is still to come, also drop that in the comment section down below, guys. I am going to ask you guys a favor. If you want to ask a question, if possible, put your question on the video where it's related. So if you see a topic in this video that you would like to ask a question about, ask it under the comment section of this video. If you're going to go and put it in the comment section of another you know, module in this course, then you're just going to confuse people and not in a fun way. That's just plain mean. So let's try and keep to the topic. So if you have a question about the topics in this video, please put it in this comment section for this specific video. You're really going to help me a lot with my admin with managing these videos and all that. So what is the next section in this module called? It is called Troubleshoot Mobile Device Issues. And this is luckily the last section in this module, guys. So if you've made it, uh, just a little bit longer. All right, so in this section, we're gonna jump into the topic of power and battery issues. That's a very common issue that you guys are going to encounter when it comes to phones. We're gonna talk about quite a few things you guys are gonna encounter on phones, but unfortunately, there's some bad news here, gents and ladies. Um, a lot of these things we've got no control over. You'll find very often the manufacturers are the ones that's causing this in the first place, and they do it on purpose. It's not accidental. Granted, there are occasions where it's accidental, but in most cases I've seen they would go and send you some sort of update through to your phone. You're going to find it's going to change the layout of your phone, the cosmetics of your phone, your menus are going to change. And very often you're also going to find the phone is going to start misbehaving. It's going to get slower. Your battery life would suddenly decline, you know, even though you know your battery is perfectly fine. You're going to find the phone will actually get very, very hot. At the moment, my, my wife's phone is actually doing that. We'll come to think of it. It's becoming very, very hot, so I should actually tell her what the issue is there becomes very very hot and if you're lucky they might release another update that will cause the heat to go away to dissipate so that it doesn't get so hot but in most cases once it starts getting hot it's not going to go away because they want you to buy a new phone it's i don't know if that's unethical but it feels unethical to me i don't like when i do that it's kind of like paying taxes i know we should pay taxes but it's it's not nice when i get forced into it and it kind of feels like paying taxes it feels like you're getting forced into buying a new phone so when it comes to poor battery health, things like battery retains less charge, severely decreased runtime. What is that? It can be a lot of things, guys, but it's most likely going to be some sort of naughty update that took place. But other things it could be, it could potentially be malware. It could really just be that the battery is now degrading. It's just time to change it. I mean, maybe it's already two or five years old. And at some point, the battery is going to fail. I mean, no battery lasts forever. Like I said earlier, of laptop batteries. It could also be that maybe you've installed some sort of application or game on your phone and it just kind of draws a lot of your battery. It's just slowly sapping away at your battery life in the background and you're not aware of it. You'll find a lot of mobile phones these days actually allow you to go into the system settings where you can actually go and check what draws power and how much power. So if your phone has that, I would say go and check in your system settings, check if you can't figure out what is drawing so much power. 
It might very well just be some application you were not aware of. Uh, it can also be improper charging taking place. Maybe your cell phone charger is damaged. It could be the cable, it could be the adapter of the cable, it could be the port on the phone that's damaged. That's actually a very common scenario that I've seen of some people's phones. They end up bending the port and it doesn't make proper contact and it charges, then it doesn't charge, or it doesn't charge properly. It could be. So there's risks from leaving battery charger unattended, especially when there's kids around or if your phone is lying in a weird unattended location. Lastly, guys, swollen battery. That's always a bad sign of any kind of device, not just cell phones or tablets. So if you ever see the swollen battery of your phone, tablet, laptop, or anything in life, that is a clear sign that that battery is failing or it has failed already and you need to dispose of that battery properly as soon as possible. Unfortunately, we can't just throw batteries in the trash because in most countries that's actually illegal, but you do want to dispose of that as quickly as possible. So I would say get a new battery if possible, if you can afford it, hopefully you can, and dispose of the old one the proper way as soon as possible. Next up, we've got hardware failure issues. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is overheating. So when your phone, laptop starts overheating, and I've said this quite a few times, it can be a lot of things. In my honest opinion, the most likely culprit here is probably going to be some sort of update. But it could be some of the other things I've just mentioned in the previous slide, or it could be overutilization. It could be that your phone's screen brightness is too much, although I haven't heard about that one. Or it could be that you've been using your phone's torch or camera too much. Also, I haven't really seen that cause any overutilization, but that might be something you want to go and look at because at the end of the day, these phones and tablets do vary from one another and they are unique at the end of the day, almost like people. It could be that maybe one day you or one of your customers or users would experience some sort of liquid damage. Very difficult to fix that kind of issue when someone has liquid damage. We're not talking about a phone overheating here now, guys. We're just talking about normal, normal liquid damage on a phone or a tablet. What can you do in those situations? What are some symptoms? So if someone tells you the device will not power on, that is probably a sign that it may or may not have been submerged in some sort of liquid. It may or may not have some sort of liquid damage. How do you recover from immersion? So if your phone or someone's phone has been in some sort of liquid, let's say water, how do you recover from that? The very first thing you want to do, assuming of course you are nearby, is you want to turn that phone off immediately, as quickly as possible to prevent any further damage, to prevent it from short-circuiting in some sort of manner. Sometimes it might be already too late, and if you're lucky enough to turn it off in time, then you want to open that phone as much as you possibly can without breaking it, and you're going to want to leave it open like that for about two to seven days. There's a, there's a myth that you can go and put it in a bag of rice. I tried it once, it actually did work. I'm not sure if my phone just magically started working, or it was the bag of rice, so I cannot confirm or deny if this actually works. But you can try it. I mean, you've got nothing to lose and something to gain because rice is generally cheap in most countries. So if you've got a phone or a tablet and you manage to open it mostly, put it in a bag full of rice or just put it in a bowl full of rice. But a bag full of rice is probably going to work. You know, put the, the rice over it, under it, next to it, everywhere as much as possible. And the, the idea here is the rice is going to absorb the moisture. It pulls the moisture out of the phone and out of the circuitry. Whether they're actually successful in doing that, I don't know, guys. Your guess is as good as mine. But at the end of the day, like I said, you've got nothing to lose here. If your phone's already damaged, you might as well try it. It's not like you've got anything else you can go and lose. Then we've got physically damaged ports. Most commonly going to happen on cell phones, but I've also seen this happen on tablets. And we literally just spoke about that when we talked about charging. So the peripherals do not work. So when the phone does not want to charge, or if you plug something into the ports of the phone, some sort of Bluetooth device or some sort of other device, maybe an external keyboard, and these devices don't want to work, that could be an indicator that some of the ports may or may not be damaged. If the battery doesn't want to charge, that could also be a sign that some of the ports might have been damaged. All right, folks, moving on to the very last topic in the very last section of Module 8, that is screen and collaboration issues. So when it comes to laptop display, if the user complains or you complain that the screen is not working, doesn't want to turn on, let's say it just doesn't want to turn on, the very first thing you want to do here is first make sure it actually is the screen because for all we know, it might not be the screen. There could be nothing wrong with the screen. So the best way to do that would be to go and plug in some sort of external screen. So isolate internal display issues versus external display issues. Make sure it actually is the screen. Get yourself an external screen 
And if it still doesn't display, then you know, okay, it's some sort of laptop issue, some other technical issue. But if the screen turns on, if you plug in an external monitor, then you know it's the actual screen of the laptop that's damaged. And you might need to go and replace it if you have one available. Then let's move on to the point of broken screen issues. If you, the user or the client, has cracks on the screen, phone or tablet, or they've shattered it, you're probably going to end up having to change it. You cannot fix that. You'll find, depending on how many layers have cracked or shattered, it'll you know, cause more of a distortion than the others, especially on phones and tablets. If you have a phone and the whole screen is cracked, but you can still perfectly see through the cracks, that is just the front layer that's damaged. We call that the digitizer layer. The digitizer layer is the one that actually senses your finger presence, the one that senses the heat from your finger or the pressure from your finger. That is the digitizer layer. But if your phone is cracked, even if it's just a small crack and it starts changing color, dark colors, it looks like they're spreading like a disease, then you have not just cracked the first layer, you've cracked multiple layers and the liquid crystal below the first layer is now actually spreading between the layers. And you'll see over time, it's going to spread more and more, kind of like a disease. And the reason it does that is because when you press down the screen, you're actually pressing the liquid more and more between the layers. That is why it's spreading and why more and more of the screen becomes dark over time. It's not because it's getting more broken, it's simply the liquid is just spreading between the layers and it's, it has nowhere to go. And whether it's just the front layer or all the layers, either way, potato, potato, you are still gonna have to replace the whole freaking screen and it's still gonna cost you the exact same amount of money, guys. And then the last point here is digitizer issues. I just mentioned to you guys what the digitizer is. That is the front layer of your phone or tablet so if your laptop has a touchscreen functionality, it probably also has a digitizer on it. But a lot of laptops don't because it's very expensive and very fancy. So on average, you'll just find a phone or a tablet of a digitizer on the screen. Now, if the digitizer doesn't want to work, it could be because your fingers are very cold. So if you're staying in a very cold country or if it's a very, very cold day, you'll find a digitizer is not going to work like it's supposed to. It's almost like it doesn't sense your fingerprint. It's because a lot of these digitizers work with heat. So if your finger is very, very, very cold on a cold day, you're going to find it's not really going to want to work because, well, it's too freaking cold. It can't sense the heat from your finger properly. It could also be because you've got too many screen protectors on your screen. It could be because your screen is too dirty, greasy, oily. There's some sort of liquid damage on it. It can be a lot of things. If all else fails and you've checked and the screen is clean and it's not broken and you've checked everything on the list, you might want to try doing a soft reset on the phone. Not a hard reset just a soft reset. That's quite often going to fix your issue. Well, folks, finally, we have reached the end of module eight. I know it's quite a long module, but it is what it is. I don't have control over that. So if you guys are still here and if you've learned something and if you've enjoyed the video, please do me a favor, give it a like. That's one way you can show your support. And if you would like to know, obviously, when I release the next module or any other form of video, then well, subscribe. Otherwise, you may not possibly know about it. You know, YouTube works like that. And then before everyone disappears, just a thank you to the sponsors, all of you guys. So the Patreon, the PayPal, and everybody else. Here's a list of some of the Patreon sponsors, the PayPal sponsors. And I also want to extend a thank you to those of you that's been clicking on the thanks button below the videos. I want to extend a thank you to those of you that's been donating coffee or a milkshake. Um, if you guys also want to sponsor me in some sort of way, you can find all of that information in the video description down below. You can become a Patreon, you can do a PayPal donation, you can go buy me a coffee or a milkshake, you can click on the thanks button below the video. There's a million and one ways should you want to go and do that. All right, folks, I will see you all on Module 9 of the CompTIA A+. Plus.